Lot, lot, lot. All right, well, I, uh, I'll get started. The uh, attendance sheet should be working its way around. But and then there's the uh, ever important top hat code up here if, you, if you're into that. <coughs> I will begin with a word of prayer. I will attempt to begin with a word of prayer. All right. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the students and the break that's about to start. Help us to uh, glorify you what we do this day and just to uh, understand the math. Help the students to ask good questions as they have. Lord, in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let's get started here. Remember, we had power series. Power series... centered at x naught with coefficients, let's say, um, a sub n, n equals 0, 1, 2, da 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 da, is, has the form, the sum, n equals 0 to infinity of a sub n times x minus x naught to the n power. If we expand that, that looks like explicitly a sub 0 plus a sub 1 times x minus x 0 plus a sub 2 times x minus x 0 squared and so forth. All right. So um, there was a math faculty who was here when I, when I started working here. His name was uh, Dr. Monty Kester. And uh, Dr. Kester used to say that these were, these were Texas-sized polynomials. And I, I kind of like that. They're, they're really, really big polynomials is a way to look at it. Um, so here's a theorem that I sketched the proof of last class, and I'll state again here. So here's a theorem. Um, power series centered at x naught has domain which is an interval um, centered at x naught. What's an interval? So let me, let me give you a technical definition of interval. An interval is a connected subset of real numbers. What's a connected subset of real numbers? A connected subset of real numbers, well, an intuitive definition I could give for you is it's, it's a set on the number line that I could draw just by using my marker or my pen in one continuous stroke, allowing for the possibility that that stroke could be infinitely long. So basically, an interval is a subset of real numbers that has no holes in it. Another way to say this, an interval is a subset of real numbers which can't be disconnected. You can't break it into two pieces where those two pieces have no connection. Right? This is a connected set have no common point in between them. There are um, only so many kinds of intervals. Let me just list them for you, OK? So connected subset of reals, if it's, if it, when I say centered at x naught, what I specifically mean is these are your possibilities. Either you've got the set just containing x naught. That's one possibility. A particularly silly possibility, but that's one, one of the th thing, uh, x naught. And by the way, this interval, we call it the um, IOC. So the interval of convergence is x naught. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that the interval of convergence is just the set x naught minus r to x naught plus r. And then there's also the possibilities 
You could close one side and leave the other open. You could open one side and close the other. You could close both sides. So there's four distinct possible patterns if the interval of convergence is finite. Okay, there's five. It could be a point, or it could either be these open interval, closed interval, half open, half closed. All right? These are the five finite possibilities. The other possibility is it's the whole real line. So <clears throat> let, me, let me erase connected subset of reals because it's in my way at the moment. So an interval is a connected subset of the reals. So here, what I actually have, I can make a table here, all right? So here I have the interval of convergence, and over here is the r, so radius of convergence. Interval of convergence. So the interval of convergence um, is a set of numbers. The radius of convergence is a number, all right? So what's the radius of convergence for case one? Zero. Zero. What's the radius of convergence for this one? Infinity. What is the radius for the other, these cases here? It's always, these are R, 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 all right, anyway. So I'm sorry it's so boring, but this is it. This is the possible domains for a power series. It's one of these things, right? Now, <clears throat> the proof of it goes like this. If, you know, you have f of x equals to the sum n equals 0 to infinity of a n times x minus x naught to the n, right? Then apply ratio test. Right? And so the ratio test, we would look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 times x minus x naught to the n plus 1 divided by um, a sub n times x minus x naught to the n power, close the absolute value, right? So by properties um, of algebra and the absolute value, this just becomes the limit as n goes to infinity of uh, the absolute value a n plus 1 divided by a n times times what? See, this, this piece over here, right, these guys, what does this simplify to? It just simplifies to x minus x naught, right? Did you guys see that? There is no end dependence on that. So for each x, that's either, it's either 0 or it's a positive number, right? Anyway, it's independent from n. Since it's independent from n, I can pull it out of the limit. And so I just have this limit, whatever that is, times x minus x naught, like that, right? So we have the limit as n goes to infinity of, you know, good grief, I need to come up with it. Let me just, a temporary notation for the sake of not writing all of this again. Let me just call this whole thing c sub n, all right? So what we have is the absolute value of c sub n plus 1 over c sub n. What does it work out to? It works out to the absolute value of x minus x naught times the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1 over a sub n, right? Okay, now let's, let's think about this logically. There's different cases, right? 
if the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1 over a n is equal to infinity, right? Then what does that mean? That means that basically these terms back here, the a n plus 1, a, a sub n plus 1 over a sub n, they're, they're, they're so huge, right, that there's, there's no way to fix it with this other, this other term over here, right? Except for one thing. There's only one thing you can do to fix it. You can just put x equal to x naught. If x is equal to x naught, you're taking the limit of the zero sequence, period. Right? Whatever, it doesn't matter that the limit of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n is blowing up to infinity. If you multiply in that thing that's going to infinity by zero, you still have the zero sequence. So th this is not the situation where we have like a type zero limit times a type infinity limit. We have a, a, a literal zero multiplying something that goes to infinity. So that's just zero. So if this, then x equals to x naught gives, let me call this thing rho, rho equals to zero. So um, s converges. Well, let me say f, f of x naught converges. But that's it, right? That's the only way to remedy this limit. So in the case that the limit of the ratio of the coefficients goes to infinity, then your interval of convergence is just a point, a single point, the center of the, uh, center of the series. Now what else could happen? If What's the other extreme? What if the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n is equal to 0? Then what happens? <laughs> then rho is equal to 0 independent of x, right? So therefore, f of x converges. for all x. Right, so in that case we just found that the interval of convergence is the whole real line. Right? And what's the other case? Either this limit's infinity, it's zero, or... See, we don't have to worry about the limit like, you're like, well, there's other ways, that, other bad things that can happen to limits, right? You could have a limit which, I guess that's true. The other possibility would be the limit, um, I guess you could have a limit which is like oscillating between zero. That's fair enough. I could have a limit which is like, you know, oscillating between zero and one, but this argument up here would still hold. In the case it doesn't go to infinity, but it like doesn't exist, you'd still have to go here because otherwise, the only way you can fix the, um, the ratio test is to put this to be zero, all right? So we're still back in the same logic. I just, I haven't written it down, but I said it, so it counts. Um, all right, so what's the other possibility? The other possibility is that the limit of this ratio let's say it's equal to L, all right? Where L is a, is a positive real number. Then what do you got? Then rho is equal to L times the absolute value of x minus x naught, isn't it? Do you guys see that? So this is L. We have absolute value of x minus x naught. In order for the ratio test to give us convergence, what do we need? We need that this is less than 1, then f of x converges, right? Now, can you guys let put this into more plain? Uh, let's fix this a little bit. What is, what is this here? This, we, we can rewrite that, right? This is the same as the absolute value of x minus x naught less than one over l, right? So f of x converges for what? f of x converges for x an element of 
x naught minus r to x naught plus r. And what else can you say in this case? You can also say that f of x diverges, right? We also can say that f of x diverges when? Not an element of here, right? Well, I can't say that, but I can say x an element of um, x with um, the absolute value of x minus x naught greater than 1 over L, right? Because if x minus x naught is greater than 1 over L, that is meaning that the row for the ratio test is larger than 1, in which case we have divergence, right? And what does this actually mean? This means that your x is an element of what? Like minus infinity to x naught minus r unioned with x naught plus r to infinity. So we know it converges within plus or minus r of x naught, right? And we know it diverges if you're beyond x naught plus or minus r. What's left? It equals. It equals, right. So what's left are these pesky endpoints. See, the pesky endpoints are uncovered. They're not covered by the ratio test because that's where the row would be 1 in this scenario. So, so then, then have to check x naught um, plus or minus r separately. So this leads to the four cases listed with finite r. And that's the proof. It's actually pretty straightforward. It's really just applying the ratio test to an arbitrary series. We've also discovered something else here, right? If you look at this proof, we can extract a theorem from this, can't we? Can you tell me what's the formula for the radius of the power series? Yeah. Well, since it would be 1 over L, that would be A sub n over A sub n plus 1. Ah, right. So I would say corollary. Um, R is equal to the limit. What did you tell me? N goes to infinity. Yes, N goes to infinity of A, of A sub N divided by A sub N plus 1. N plus 1, right. And I, I'd say that that's, I, I should really put some quotes around that, okay? Because that's a, it's a actually a little bit, it's, it's a little bit more subtle than this. And the reason for that is sometimes you have series we want to allow for series which have zeros for like all of the odd terms, or zeros for all of the even terms, or zeros for all the multiples of three. Anyway, an infinite bunch of zeros in the mix. We, we don't want to have to like treat those separately or like re-index them so that there, there's no zeros in the, in the thing. So the more careful statement of these things uses more sophisticated math. But, so I should put some quotes around this because it's not quite true, because you could have coefficients. You could have coefficients. This is definitely so. I can take the square. You can remove the square, square, uh, square quotes. Remove the, if um, we have, you know, um, a sub n not equal to 0 for all n. Otherwise, we have to. Um, consider that limit in the appropriate sense for the problem. Like we might, I, I'd have to, have to come up with it. Let me, let me see if I can find an example to scratch this itch I'm trying to get at. Example one. Suppose you had like the sum, oh, I don't know, um, x to the 2n divided by, oh, I don't know, 2 um, 2n plus 1, n equals 0 to infinity. So in this situation, if I look at it, I have 
a sub 2n equal to 1 over 2n plus 1, right? But I have a sub 2n um, plus 1 equal to 0. So all my odd coefficients are 0, right? So if I just take um, the corollary which Caleb was suggesting at face value, then like that's not quite true, right? Because you're going to have division by 0. You can't actually calculate that limit meaningfully. But still, I mean, we can work it out in this case, right? What's the limit? Let's calculate rho, right? Rho, the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x to the 2 times n plus 1 divided by 2 times n plus 1 plus 1 um, times 2n plus 1 divided by x to the 2n. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the limit n goes to infinity of, well, apparently 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus, I think, 3? Right? And then what? Times the absolute value of x, like that. Why is it only x? Because you're saying it's zero? Because x to the, oh wait a minute. My bad. You're right. What should I have? Thank you. Very good. You're right. Very good. x to the 2n plus 1 divided by x to the 2n is what? x to, the, it's not 2n plus 1, it's 2 times n plus 2, right? Um, so that actually should be x squared. Thank you. The story remains the same though, right? When does that, when is that less than 1? Well, first of all, what is that equal to? This is just equal to the absolute value of x squared, right? Because that limit is 1. Do you guys see that? Do you remember when I said there will come a time when I want you to just write these limits down and you don't have to work them out? That time is now. So we need that to be less than 1. How can we, how can we achieve that? Um, x is an element of minus 1 to 1, right? So in this case, the, ra the ratio, um, <laughs> well, this is not a good example in terms of radius because you're not going to be able to see the reciprocal from it. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> like, this would have been better if I'd made this work out to 2, then we could have seen that we need to flip these in order to, you know, it's, duh. Well, I'm not going to try to fix it, but my, my point to you here is that the ratio is actually the limit as, well, what is it? It's the limit, um, how do I want to say this? It's the limit as n goes to infinity, right, of the absolute value, actually, as it turns out, of, let's say, a sub 2n plus 2 divided by a sub 2n. I mean, that's what I should sort of m put here, for example, 1. The, the, we don't actually even care about the limit of the quotient of the zero, subse the zero odd subsequence. It's just the even subsequence, which is determining the radius. So like the full version of this corollary has to be something about subsequences. All right. Listen, when I write up the notes, I'll try to come up with a careful statement of the corollary, okay? So you guys can look at it then. But let's, let's focus on examples for today, yeah? Yep. Why is it that the odd base of, or n is odd and is equal to zero? Is that just what you stated? Or? Oh, it's just fine by inspection. There's only even powers here. Like there's no, um, there's no x term, there's no x cubed term, there's no x to the fifth term. So the coefficient of x, x cubed, x to the fifth would be x, uh, would be a sub 1, a sub 3, a sub 5 by definition. It's just like in the quadratic formula, if you have x squared minus 11, 
and then you ask what the A and the B and the C are. Well, the B is zero because there's no B. In the same sense, there's no A sub odd, odd index, this one. Is this the interval of convergence? What's that? No. The answer is, I don't know, maybe. This is what I would refer to as the open <coughs> interval of convergence. The open interval of convergence is the largest open set on which the given power series converges. Right? So for the open interval of convergence, you don't care about the endpoints. But the interval of convergence, it might include one of the endpoints. Now, how can we figure out whether or not the endpoints are included? What do you got to do? You just have to check them, check them, se check them separately. All right. So, for this one here, um, so check endpoints, right? Check endpoints. All right. So we do that, and um, what we got. So if I call this thing f of f of x, right? What is our endpoints would be what? Like f of minus one. What's f of minus one? One to the two n, right? Divided by two n plus one. And what would f of uh, f of one be equal to? Oh, it's the same stupid thing, isn't it? <laughs> because in this one, um, well, I mean, so, sorry, my bad. Minus 1 to the 2n, right? 1 to the 2n, fine. And it's, it's, these are both equal to what, though? They're both this series. So it, it's either all in or all out. Either we get both endpoints or we don't get either of them, right? Does that series converge or diverge? Whew, it's a good thing I didn't put this one on the test. <laughs> What's that? It should be converge. Ooh. I, I feel like that's a no. P equals one. It's not exactly the P equals one, right? But it's it's like it's half of the P equals one series in some sense, right? Like this is one, um, it's what? It's, it's, it's one plus a third plus a fifth, right? My intuition says that this diverges. I'm not absolutely sure, but um, let's see here. Well, if it's less than p equals one, that doesn't. See, it's so tempting, right? <laughs> Inequalities are so unforgiving, aren't they? <laughs> um, Uh, I, I don't know, I, limit comparison maybe? Yep. We could try limit comparison test with p equals 1. I think that would work, right? So if you look at the limit as n goes to infinity of like 1 over 2n plus 1 divided by 1 over n, what do you get? You get n over 2n, my bad. You get the limit as n goes to infinity of n over 2n plus 1, which is equal to 1 half. So therefore, by the limit comparison test, because we have limit comparison test with, you know, positive ratio limit, that means that the two series share the same fate. In this case, it therefore diverges, yeah. I think you could also, um, with that original summation, factor out the two out of the denominator um, and move the 1 half outside of the sum. And you can do like Sum you wrote, wrote out first. Oh, the sum I wrote out first. Yeah, that, what you just pointed to. Oh, this one? I think you can factor out the two from the denominator. Uh huh. And then you can just do like a j equals n plus one half substitution. And it would just be a p equals one series. But I, but I can't substitute j equals n plus a half. Oh, true, you're right. I mean, I want to believe. 
But I, I don't think you've. I, I, I don't. I, so, you'd like to change the addition in the denominator to a subtraction so that you can find a smaller series which diverges, which would be the tail of the. I, I think you got. I mean, you're, I think you could do it that way, but you've got to go the other direction, like something like n equals to oh, I don't know. J maybe J minus one will do, maybe I don't know. If I do n equals to j minus 1, then I've got 1 over um, 2 times j minus 1 plus 1, right? Which would give me 1 over 2j minus 1. And then the thing is, if I do that, I've got actually the sum j, where does my j start then? If n equals to 0, j equals 2. One. So, right, that has to be greater than the sum of one over two j, because I just made the I, that that one has a large, a smaller denominator, and hence a larger fraction, term by term. So that I can do direct comparison to one half of the p equals one series, just like you said. So you got the right idea. But just you got to be more conniving in your rewriting of it. I am lazy, though, so I will use the limit comparison test. <laughs> As limit comparison test frees me of the obligation of thinking about inequalities, right? That's why limit comparison test is powerful, is because most of us are very bad at inequalities, and this is a way of hiding our ignorance. Yes? <laughs> um, and that is a creative leap. Right? Of course, I guess once you make that leap a couple times, it becomes less creative, but. All right, so there's an example. And this time, so what, what's the conclusion is the radius of convergence is 1. The interval of convergence is minus 1 to 1, because both of the endpoints failed. All right, so let's work another example. I know this is not the especially exciting part of the material, but it is a necessary uh, part of the discussion. We have to come to an understanding of what the domain of these things is, and it really is just ratio test every time and check the endpoints. That, that's the algorithm. Sometimes it's easier, like this one. Check this out. If I have the sum, let's say, n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, if we look at the ratio test in this case, so I'm, I'm just not using the um, corollary. I mean, so here's the thing, guys, is like, am I going to use the corollary? Am I not going to use the corollary? In the past, I have not been able to make my mind up. If you look through my solutions in past courses, you'll see sometimes I eventually get tired of writing this down and go straight to the corollary that was suggested, you know. The point is that this, I think it's healthy though to just work through the ratio test. I mean, it's, it's safe. You can think through it. I don't know. I'm, I'm debating, guys. What's n factorial, n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial, right? And then we can factor out the absolute value of x. What's that limit? So this guy goes to? Zero. Yes. So this is equal to zero, which is less than one. So therefore, um, interval of convergence for this one is everything. Okay. So, okay. Example three. We could look at the sum. 
let's say j equals uh, 0 to infinity of, oh, I don't know, um, x to the j divided by 2 to the j um, times j plus 1. Right. Let me just write out a couple terms here just to keep, my, keep myself on the straight and narrow. If I plug in j equal to 0, I get 2 to 0. So I get 1. My first term is 1. All right. What happens when I put in j equal to 1? This is 2. That's 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So I get plus 1 fourth x. What's next? Plug in j equal to 2, I get 2 to the 2, which is 4. 4 times 3, 1 twelfth x squared. All right, and so the story goes. Evaluating the series for the first couple of indices is an important calculational skill that you must acquire if you don't have it already. You guys don't usually have a problem with this part of it, though, so I don't belabor it much. Um, OK, so let's figure out the interval of convergence. So the question, again, is the same. What is the domain? If I call this f of x, right? What's the largest inter interval of convergence for which this formula functions? That's the interval of convergence. All right, so I'm going to use the corollary this time, because this one I can do it for. Because this one has my a sub, um, you know, a sub j is not equal to 0 for all j. So the radius of convergence should be equal to the limit as j goes to infinity of what? a sub j divided by a sub j plus 1, right? So what is that? We've got the limit as j goes to infinity of, looks like, um, 2 to the j plus 1 times j plus 2 divided by 2 to the j times j plus 1. Can we calculate this limit? I think we can. We've got ourselves a limit as j goes to infinity of 2 <laughs> times j plus 1 j plus 2, rather, over j plus 1. What's that go to? Zero? Not, not zero. What's that? One. One? Also wrong. So you are right. I think what you're thinking about is this piece goes to one. But there's still this two here, so the answer is two. So the radius of convergence for this example is 2. So that implies that the interval of convergence at least includes minus 2 to 2. This symbol right here is like includes. What it means is that minus 2 to 2 is a subset of the interval of convergence. It's just subset written in the opposite way. So we still need to check the endpoints, right? We should check the endpoints. What's that look like here? What are the endpoints? F of, well, we got F of, uh, Minus 2, right? What's that equal to? We've got some j equals 0 to infinity minus 2 to the j divided by 2 to the j times j plus 1. So
So what we're looking at is the series sum j equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the j over 2 to the j, excuse me, just minus 1 to the j over j plus 1. The, the 2 to the j cancels by algebra. Yes? Why don't you do a to the j over a to the j plus 1 instead of a to the j plus 1 over a to the j? Because we figured out that it was the reciprocal of the coefficients that gave us the radius. It goes back to the calculation that I've just erased, okay. unfortunately, because we came to this calculation that L times the apps value of x minus x naught um, has to be less than 1, which gave us that x minus x naught is less than 1 over L. But this L was equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1 over a n plus 1 a n. And so we identify that that's equal to r. And then flippity floppity. Yeah. What's that? Converge or diverge? Alternating series. The terms clearly go to 0, right? I mean, this is the alternating harmonic series. We spent like 20 minutes writing out partial sums for this, seeing that they go to the natural log of 2. This one definitely converges. How about f of 2? What's going to happen there? See the difference when you plug in 2? When you plug in 2, you get 2 to the j over 2 to the j, right? Those cancel. And it just leaves you 1 over j plus 1 which is divergent. Why? It's the p equals 1 series. So what's the interval of convergence? IOC is equal to we include minus 2. We exclude and the radius of convergence, of course, is 2. I think you guys got a bunch of homework problems, like find the IOC, find the ROC, right? Should I do another? I'm going to do another, and then I'm going to move on to calculus of power series, which is more fun. Let us find the radius and interval of convergence for this series. Now you might expect me to do the same thing I just did, but I'm not going to. And the reason for that is that this is equal to 1 plus 3 times x minus 4 plus 9 times x minus 4 squared plus 27 times x minus 4 cubed plus dot dot dot. In other words, this has the form c plus cr plus cr squared plus dot 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 dot. This is a geometric series. It's a geometric series with c equals to 1 and r equals to so just identify that r is equal to 3 times x minus 4. When does it converge? 
converges if and only if the magnitude of r is less than 1. That's the theorem. You guys proved it. Problem 1, test 2, right? Geometric series. Now, admittedly, you're applying the geometric series theorem infinitely many times, one for each x. But that doesn't make it any less logical. All you got to do, then, is look at the absolute value of 3 times x minus 4 to be less than 1. Right? And then that's what? Absolute value of x minus 4 less than 1 third. What does this say? This says that the distance from x to 4 is less than 1 third. In other words, the interval of convergence equals to 4 minus 1 third to 4 plus 1 third. And the radius of convergence is a third. So it doesn't have to be complicated. I mean, we could add the fractions if that'll make you feel better. Uh, 11 thirds, 13 thirds, there you go, right? Yep. Because it's there. I'm applying the geometric series theorem to this series. No, that's to an n power. So if you want to think of it this way, if you think of all of this collectively as, let's say, um, well, I'm using a, let me use a capital A just for a second, a sub n, then the ratio of a n plus 1 to a n, right, is 3 times x minus 4. And that's true for all n. Therefore, this is a geometric series because it's the sum of a geometric sequence. So th these are glorious because you don't have to check the endpoints. Because the geometric series says that the geometric series theorem says that the geometric series converges if and only if the, ratio, the radius is less than 1. So we're done. We know what's going to happen. I mean, you can check the endpoints if you want. If you plug in, what happens if you plug in 11 thirds into here? You get minus a third. Minus a third to the n times 3 to the n gives you minus 1 to the n. Diverges by nth term test. The limit doesn't exist. If you plug in 13 thirds, you get 1 third to the n times 3 to the n, which gives you the sum n equals 0 to infinity of, of 1. That was our first example of a divergent series. So what's going to happen with the geometric series is if you check the endpoints, they're, good, they're both going to diverge by the nth term test. That has to happen because that's how you proved that the geometric series only works when the radius is less than 1. Right? Well, I guess, well, anyway. Let me not talk about, less, let me not talk about the solution to the test at the moment. It might be a sore issue. I don't know. I haven't started grading yet, so. Your secret's safe with me. Um, in fact, don't worry. I'm not going to grade your test before break. I don't want to ruin your break. And Dr. Sperano warned me. He's like, don't, don't give them the test before break. Let them have break. Let them. No? You disagree? I should try to grade it tonight? It's up to me. Don't, don't put this on us. <laughs> <laughs> don't, I mean, what's done is done, right? <laughs> okay, so this is it for finding interval of convergence and radius of convergence. I can do more examples, but that's it. That's it. Either you apply the ratio test or recognize it as geometric, and then you're done. Yeah. Is it like a, like a is there time you record there, or does it Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's not really a big savings. I mean, if you apply the ratio test directly, it's just like one more algebra step to see what the, uh, what the radius is. So the, the full statement of it is that you have to look at something called the, um, you have to use the, limb, the, uh, 
you have to do a limit, which is like overall possible subsequences. So it's a little bit more sophisticated than this course tends to be. But to give the full unqualified theorem, it involves something called the limit supremum, which is, well, it sounds kind of awesome, but um, yeah. The limbs up. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see here. Calculus. This is really, really complicated, so pay close attention, all right? The derivative with respect to x of a0 plus a1 times x minus x0 plus a2 times x minus x0 squared plus dot 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 is equal to a1 plus a2, oh, excuse me, 2a2 times x minus x0 plus 3a3 times x minus x0 squared plus dot dot dot. <laughs> Extremely complicated. You would never have guessed this, right? <laughs> no. So this is called the term by term differentiation theorem. Here's what it looks like in a more scary notation. So n equals 0 to infinity of a sub n x minus x naught to the n. It's equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of n a sub n times x minus x naught to the n minus 1. Be careful. Mm. It might be right, it might in some sense be better. You know, let me just say this. You know what? Let me say this. Let's let's put a zero here. And and you might think that I'm being like kind of well, why would you do that? You're just adding zero. There's a reason. When we get to it, I'll remind you that I said this, okay? So number two, the integral of a0 plus a1 times x minus x naught um, plus dot 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 dot. Guess what? Um, you guessed it. a0 times x minus x naught um, plus a1 over 2 x minus x naught squared plus dot 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 dot. And then we should add a constant because it is an indefinite integral, right? So here, here's how that looks. Sum n equals 0 to infinity a sub n x minus x naught to the n dx is equal to a constant plus the summation n equals 0 to infinity of a sub n divided by n plus 1 times the quantity x minus x naught to the n plus 1. So this is kind of cool, right? I mean, simple, right? Now, I have not proved that these things are true, have I? I have not. Well, I guess I'll leave this. We can just trust you. You just trust me? Well, indeed, students do trust me, usually, about these sorts of things. They're very willing to give me all the trust in the world if it means I'm not having to watch a proof. Go figure. But um, yeah, I know. It's strange. In fact, so, in fact, I was doing research on, on um, calculus over in algebra. And um, I got to the point where I was studying how do you do calculus of power series for an algebra variable. And so I got to the place where I was, supposed, I was trying to prove that the derivative of a series, um, you get it term by term, term by term differentiation, right? So like, let's think about this for a second here. So if you've got f of x equals to the sum n equals 0 to infinity, you know, a sub n, x minus x naught to the n, then what's df dx? We just wrote it down, right? Sum n equals 0 to infinity of n. Um, I'll even make it 1 this time just to be 
cantankerous, uh, a n x minus x naught to the n minus 1. All right, great. So, okay, so um, in this, and let's, for the simplicity of discussion, let's assume a sub n is not equal to 0 for all n. All right? So we can use Caleb's corollary. And in that case, I can calculate the radius of the derivative series, right? What's the radius of the FDX series? The limit as n goes to infinity of what? So here's my, let's call it b sub n. So I should do what? b sub n over b sub n plus 1 to calculate the radius, right? Because it goes flippity flop for the radius formula. And what is that? Well, that's apparently n a n divided by n plus 1 times a sub n plus 1, right? You're like, but, 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 but I don't know what a n is. True. I don't really care what a n is. My point to you is whatever it is, there's a relation here, right? So you're going to have the limit as n goes to infinity of n times n plus 1 times the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n divided by a n plus 1, right? Now, you guys can tell me what this one is, right? What's this? This one goes to 1. This is the, ra the radius for f of x. It's the radius for the original series. Oh, so differentiation does not change the radius of convergence. That's kind of neat, right? And you could do almost the same calculation to show that integration also does not change the radius of convergence. Right? So I've done this calculation with like every calculus 2 that I've ever taught pretty much. In one sense or another, I've done this to prove that, well, if the, if the given series converges for a given x, then the derivative of the series also converges for a given x. But there's a subtle point here that does not prove, mind you, that does not prove that this right here is actually the derivative of this function. To prove that that's the derivative of that function, you have to prove that the limit quotient works out as it's supposed to, calculus one style. That's actually very difficult. But it's, it's something that I have taught calculus a half a dozen times and no one ever noticed. The only time I ever noticed it was I was in research and I come to the analogous question for like abstract series and all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute. Oh, and then I was like, how do you, I thought I, I thought I proved it. I had, no, I haven't proved it. And then, and then I looked at the appendix to the book by Salas and Hilly, which we were teaching out of at the time, and I found the proof there, and I was like, oh, that's why we don't cover this. It's ugly. So anyway, but it is, tr it is true, but there's something technical here that I'm hiding, and I'll, I'll spare you that, okay? I do intend to put it in my type notes, right? Okay, so great. Does this help us? Like, can we use this? Like, how is this interesting? Let me show you something. So, the one thing we can do is just kind of like, this is not particularly clever. It's just kind of like, oh, well, yeah, I guess you could do that. Example, what am I on, six? Here's an example. Suppose you want to integrate dx over 1 minus x to the eighth. I'll, I'll stick an x cubed up over here just to be particularly malevolent. Oh, I guess that actually, that actually would make this doable, wouldn't it? Because then I could make an x to the fourth substitution, and that would be a du integral, which we've got to inverse tangent. That's too nice. There. There. That's, that's less friendly. Do this integral. Anyway, I'd have to work very hard to attempt this in the other way of doing. It is a rational function, so the integral 